This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. Search for Economist Podcasts Plus and sign up to our free one-month trial. It's time to say goodbye to hold music and say hello to fast customer support with Service Cloud. With trusted AI and data working together, you can skip long wait times and deliver efficient, personalized service right away. All while keeping support costs low and more customers happy. Reimagine your customer support with the number one AI CRM for service. Learn what's possible at Salesforce.com/products/service. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high yield savings account that's built right into the Wallet app. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. This episode is brought to you by Clavio, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Clavio, you can activate all your customer data in real time. Connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels. Guide your marketing strategy with AI-powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance. Deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Clavio. Learn more at clavio.com/spotify. That's k l a v i y o.com/spotify. Welcome to the HCI family of podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with Jerry Colonna about why leaders must prioritize empathy amid DEI challenges. Jerry Colonna, welcome to the conversation today. Thanks for having me, John. It's a delight to be here with you. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Colorado. I am south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and how it connects with prioritizing empathy and belonging and why this is super important for leaders to be paying attention to in the modern workforce and within our current uh, political and social context and the challenges facing organizations today. As we get started, I wanted to share Jerry's bio with everybody. Jerry Colonna is a leading executive coach who uses the skills he learned as a venture capitalist to help entrepreneurs. He is a co-founder and CEO of Reboot, the executive coaching and leadership development company, host of the Reboot podcast, and author of Reunion, Leadership and the Longing to Belong, and Reboot, Leadership and the Art of Growing Up. He draws on his wide variety of experiences to help clients design a more conscious life and make needed changes to their career to improve their performance and satisfaction. Now, I could go on more about your background and your history, but I'm going to pause there. Jerry, anything else you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Well, less about personal background and more about a core philosophy, which is put simply that better humans make better leaders. Mm. And at the process of being a better human 
is really, really hard. Mm. And because it's hard, we struggle to have good leadership. Yeah. I often, you know, when I, when I have a frustration, um, mm. with, with, within an organizational setting, you know, I'll often kind of mutter to myself or even to a colleague or to my wife when I go home at night and I'm like, man, I just wish people could just be mature adults. <laughs> and and that, I think that's, that's my first book. <laughs> and, you know, I, I feel like that's kind of getting to your point yeah. about just being a better human. Now I do believe most people wake up in the morning thinking, you know, how can I go to work and do my best work and interact with my people in healthy ways? Like most people don't wake up thinking, ha ha ha, how am I going to take advantage of my people today? You know? And so I don't think most people are nefarious. I have known some people like that, that I think literally (laughs) do that, but I think that's rare. I think most people want to do right by others. They want to treat people well. Um, But we have different levels of personal development, you know, just in terms of like those basic human humanity skills. Uh, And it does make a difference when, when the, where the rubber meets the road. And when you come up against challenging situations, that's where you, you, you see the true metal of an individual. Um, Not when things are easy or you're just trying to keep things humming along. It's when the real challenges come in front of you and you have to make those hard decisions that you're going to see whether or not someone actually you know, believes in the values they've been espousing. Yeah, I I, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, one of the core premises of my first book, Reboot, was that uh, there is an opportunity implicit in the experience of being a leader to actually confront the parts of ourselves that we'd really rather not mm. talk about mm-hmm. so that we can actually use the process of leading others to grow into that fully functioning adult that we both mm-hmm. yearn to, to, to both be and to work with, you know, um, I think that that's part of the toxicity that we experience in our work environments is that too many of us who hold power hold back from doing the important interior work, the internal mm-hmm. work. Mm-hmm. And the result is everybody else pays the price. Yeah. And it will manifest. Like you may think that you're able to just keep it under wraps. I think most people are fairly savvy about being able to detect, you know, their, their BS meter or, yes. or just being able to, to feel if someone's being genuine with them or if someone's really listening or if they're just doing performative measures to act That's like they're right. listening, you know, That's like right. I think most people can, can, feel that out and sense that pretty well. And, and so if you think you're somehow going to be able to, to avoid that or kind of pull it over on people, most people won't, Uh, at least the more you work with somebody, the less you're going to be able to hide it. Right. That's that, that's right. And, and when the person in power pretends and everybody else kind of goes along with the pretense, we Mm -hmm. have a kind of almost kabuki theater Mm. going on where people are actually not dealing with the issues. You know, if we circle back to this notion of creating inclusivity and equity within our organizations, so many of those efforts fall short because those who hold power are performative in their efforts. Mm -hmm. They, you know, what I argue in the new book is that Building on what we were saying before, and I use a term uh, I coined years ago called radical self-inquiry. When those who are in power seek to, or or a call to answer what I call the longing to belong, without doing the necessary first step of saying, well, who am I? How have I benefited from uh, conditions in the world that I say I don't want to see. Mm-hmm. How has that shaped my journey into power, into leadership? Mm-hmm. If I dive into this work without first doing that necessary work, the risk is really high that that the efforts are going to be performative. And they're mm-hmm. going to fall short in creating what it is that we want in the first place which is an organization, a society, a state, a community where even the least of us feel like we belong. Yeah. Well, there's a lot there that you just said that I I love and I'd love to drill in on Mm -hmm. the radical self-inquiry piece. I think that's truly essential. 
Um, mm-hmm. If we want to develop ourselves and become better humans and more adult, you know, as we've been talking about, I don't see any other way for that to happen uh, unless Amen. you're, you're, you're going through that constant self-reflective exercise um, or as you framed it, radical self-inquiry. I, I think that's mm-hmm. essential in order for us to develop. And until we better understand ourselves and where we're coming from and our own baggage and our, you know, our, all the stuff that we've been dealing with, un- until we can unpack that for ourselves, it's going to be really hard for us to truly be able to sit with and be with those around us and better understand them and to have the empathy to to see where they're coming from and and to have that feed into our decision making. Um, I'm just not sure I see a way around that. Now, I, I, it's a tricky thing, you know, on the one hand, performative, like nobody wants to just do performative stuff. Um, that's not healthy. Uh, it's not effective. And I think if you ask most leaders, they'd say, yeah, I'm not doing performative things. I'm, I, I really believe in this. This is something I feel strongly about. Um, and, and so I think there often is a disconnect between kind of the aspirational goals that I think it's good mm-hmm. to have, like you want to shoot for the stars and, and, you know, even though I'm develop, I'm developing myself, you know, I'm building the plane while I'm flying it personally, you know, yeah. I, I can't expect for me to be at the end goal right now. So I have aspirational goals. I'm shooting for the stars. I'm coming up short. Hopefully I'm practicing that radical self-inquiry so I can learn from the setbacks and, and do better the next time, et cetera. And so I, I've seen leaders though, who are like, they're so worried about the performative stuff and like being seen as disingenuous that they don't even try <laughs> to do right. those things, um, that's which that's right. not good. Like I'd rather have someone, you know, be making the effort, even though they're kind of early stages and still that's rather right. naive and immature or uh, unsophisticated, you know, unsophisticated in how they approach it. I'd rather have them. They got to start somewhere. Right. I guess is my point. And so I'm wondering, you know, where do you come down on that? Like how, how do we balance this need for, you know, uh, for doing these things, creating the mechanisms, the channels for the communication to happen for, for, you know, us to do these DEI things in meaningful ways, yet also realizing you got to start somewhere. And, and sometimes, yeah. you know, give maybe my own personal history or the organization I'm working with or the existing predominant culture or, or whatever, you know, there's all these potential constraints around me, you know, may, maybe the best thing I can do at this point is, vocalize some aspirational goals and try to start to put in place and create some me- muscle memory around some practices. I don't know. Any thoughts on I, that? I, 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 yeah, I, I, a lot. Um, first, I'll reference something. Um, in the new book that I've written, um, I, I described the story of my daughter protesting the murder of George Floyd. Mm. And she identifies as a uh, half Asian and a straight woman. Mm-hmm. And if it's not obvious, I identify as a straight, white, cisgender male. And um, like a lot of folks, I was deeply disturbed by the video, by the murder. Mm-hmm. And she was out protesting in the streets one night during the middle of the COVID pandemic. And as her daddy, I was scared. Mm. Mm -hmm. And as I began texting with her about the consequences of being pepper sprayed, Mm -hmm. I had to confront the fact that I was completely safe. And what came back to me was something she used to say to me all the time, in only the way a daughter who is onto her father can say. (laughs) She would say, dad, it's not enough to be an ally. You have to be a co-conspirator. Mm. so you take that in i took that in and i said to myself there is something deeply important that needs to be written about from the perspective of those who actually have benefited from the dominant structures Mm -hmm. because it is not uh you know, some people might say well what gives you the right to talk about these things and my response to that is What gives me the right to not talk about these things? Mm. Because the fact is, John, people are dying. Because we cannot resolve our fear of the other person, or to your point, to circle it all the way back to your point, or because well-intentioned people are afraid of getting it wrong, so they say nothing. 
And as I wrote in the book, I may fail to make a difference, which is what my intention is. But I'm not going to fail because I didn't try. And I think that that's the call all of us have to answer. Because what we've been doing doesn't work. Too many people are dying. And too many of our employees are carrying that burden. Now, that's a negative point of view. Let's talk about the positive side of this. What if we created communities where people felt like they they were safe, that they were loved, that they were appreciated, and that they belonged? What a magical goal. Yeah, we're going to fail. But to your point, and to Robert Browning's point, man's reach should exceed his grasp or else what's a heaven for? That's the whole point of it all. So anyway, I, I got a little prosaic, but it's because I care so much about this. Yeah, well, well I, I think you're absolutely right. It's essential um, that we, <clears throat> excuse me, mm-hmm. that we get off the sidelines and that we get right. involved. I, I'm also a straight cisgender white dude. You know, I have right. all, I check all the boxes of privilege. Um, I can, you know, I was also horrified by the George Floyd murder, uh, and a lot of the other things that were happening that, that was a rough summer, you know, that yes. <laughs> talk, talk, talk about things get layer upon layer of like upheaval yeah. and challenges and stuff. And, and I felt it, but you know, it wasn't until, you know, I, I talked to people of color that I, you know, it wasn't just upsetting to them. It was like completely different levels of, right. of distraught, you know, and just of like their world being rocked and like how they're dealing with it versus how me and my privilege and my protected safe place, right. you know, h- how right. I was approaching it. And so at that point I have to decide, like, am I going to leverage any privilege I might have to, to extend the voice of others or to be an, an ally and an advocate um, for the cause? Uh, or am I just going to, you know, say, well, I'm a white guy. What, what do I have to say about this? Uh, and, and just kind of say it's someone else's issue or someone else's problem. That's what often happens. And that's what often, it's not just a societal thing. It happens in organizations all the time too. All the um, time. Where people see unfairness, you know, the general principle of let's treat people with dignity and respect. Most people are going to say, yeah, I believe in that. So, and most people want there to be fairness. Um, yet we all observe you know, inconsistencies, unfairness, uh, even retribution, retaliation, uh, even exploitation, we all experience those things in workplaces all the time. And are we willing to speak up about it? Are we willing to to utilize any political power That's right. that we might have within our organization or within our team to try to put a stop to it or to try to resolve it? And a lot of people aren't, it, you know, the bystander effect. I don't know if that's the primary thing or people are just uncomfortable. They think someone else will take care of it. They're not sure how to respond. Some people just are scared and they just don't want to, you know, they're worried about their own job. And so they don't want to speak up. And I get all of that, um, but we do have to get past it. We have to get past um, the fear components and be willing to move into the uncertainty of being that advocate, uh, you know, being uh, someone who makes good trouble within organizations and society. Absolutely. Um, Elie Wiesel said, neutrality always favors the oppressor. Mm. And that's a really important thing to take in because our fear of getting it wrong, our fear of losing our own tenuous hold on belonging on safety uh, prevents us too often from actually speaking up and speaking out. And to go back to the analogy we're using before, being the fully actualized adult who can actually lean into tough situations. And if I've got it wrong, correct me. I can withstand feedback. I can withstand being told, no, that's wrong, Jerry. Because the goal is so important. And I'll, I'll, I'll add one quick point here. 
look, uh, the good Lord saw fit to give me the ability to put two words together in such a way that people sometimes listen. In addition to my power and privilege, I have a moral responsibility to utilize that to make the world just a slightly better for everybody. I'm not going to solve the problem. You're not going to solve the problem. We're not going to solve the problem. But there's a quote in the book from the Talmud that goes, it is not yours to complete the work, but neither are you at liberty to neglect the work. Mm -hmm. That to me is a call. You got to try, even though you know you're going to fail. And you get up the next day and you try again to make the world just a little bit safer, a little bit better for the immigrant trying to cross the border into the United States, for the woman who is trying to secure her rights as a human being, for those suffering under the yoke of oppression in some form or another. Why are we here? if not to lift a burden for other people. So I can end my day with a few more toys? <sighs> Please. Yeah. There's more to life than that. Yeah. And I, I want to make another point here. You know, we, we've been focusing on perhaps the underserved, disadvantaged, marginalized communities, uh, whether it be in society or within an organization. And that's really, really important. I think sometimes when, you know, trying to make the case for diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, and belonging efforts within an organization, I often will hear from colleagues that look like me, you know, from other right. straight cisgender white dudes. They're like, well, what about me? Like, what, what about like why we're focusing on everyone else? What about me? And mm -hmm. well, that I cringe every time I hear that, I do understand where they're coming from. And I understand that it's a fear-based response and reaction. And I think it's important to reiterate to, to people that what we're talking about, it will better the lives of everybody. Everyone. <laughs> it, you know, That's if I'm right. treating everyone with dignity and respect within the organization with fairness and equity, certainly that will benefit, you know, those who have been disproportionately disadvantaged in the past. Uh, but it will help. I want to be treated with dignity and respect. You know, right. I, I don't want anyone to not. And so rising tide lifts all ships. Like we're going to make the, the workplace better for everybody when we create systems and processes and procedures that are more fair and equitable. Um, you know, whether you're comfortable using a DEI B lens or not, right. I ultimately, I don't think that matters. I think most people you know, recognize the humanity in like just treating people well, treating people with dignity and respect. Let's not just get caught up in the politicalization of it, you know, in the polarization I, I, of it I, I, um, I, I that think sometimes I, get, we get stuck I, in, you know? Yeah, I think that that's right. And I think the politicalization and polarization exacerbate the problem, exacerbate the separation. Um, two things I would add to this. One is, when you reconnect, and the reason the book is titled Reunion, is I'm describing a reunification with the parts of ourselves and even the stories, perhaps, of our ancestors who themselves may have experienced some challenges, regardless mm -hmm. of how you identify. When we reunite with those stories, we lay the foundation for an empathetic bridge to the other person. Mm -hmm. So that the other doesn't become some fearful, unknown quantity, but they become, as I describe in the book, like fingers on a hand, individual fingers, individual expressions of the same experience. And so when we connect with our own story and our own experience, the root behind that fear, well, what about me? When we connect with that, we can lay the possibility for empathetic connection to other people's stories. Now, if we imagine a world where we actually pause and listen to each other's stories, then it's possible that the inclusivity work that we then set ourselves to is based on deep shared empathy and compassion. Because 
my story doesn't have to be the same as your story. Yeah. It just has to be similar enough for me to see your humanity. Because that's really what we're talk talking about here. John, we're talking about pushing up against dehumanization. Of no longer seeing the other person as less than human. Mm -hmm. But just like me, they want love, safety, and belonging. Yeah, that's what we all want. We all want belonging. We want we all want to be at a place where we're needed, wanted, valued, where we have an opportunity to contribute in meaningful ways or we're treated fairly with dignity and respect. You know, that's, that's a fairly it. straightforward foundational thing. We all want it. I think we all can connect there, you know. And that's so right. if if we're having trouble with these conversations in our organizations or in our communities, let's take a step back and do a reset to like there um, where you, I think you got pretty it. much everyone can agree. Well, Jerry, this has just been a great conversation. I know at the time I need to let you go here in just a minute, but before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Well, the best way to, to reach out is uh, the website reunion.reboot.io. Dot io not dot com um reboot.io is the company and reunion is the uh website specifically around the book and there you'll find videos we have a limited series podcast called reunion stories of belonging some really beautiful resources for people to sort of lean into these questions um and i guess the last thing i would say is to circle back to something i said before why is this so important this is so important because people are literally dying. Mm. Babies are being shot. And we as business leaders have an opportunity to lead, to kind of do some healing work, to overcome that which separates us. That's I know that's the, the world I want to leave my children and grandchildren. I think that's the world we all want to leave. I hope so, at least. I think so too. Jerry, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Jerry can do for you. Check out his books. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe, and please join us again soon.